Um, yeah, so good morning. I'm talking about uh, fruit growing as an art form today. And I think we've had a fantastic example of that from Andy's uh, talk there. Like, uh, if that isn't an, an art form, then I, I don't know what is. Um, so since this webinar is about trained fruit in historic gardens, I'm going to be looking at this from a historical angle using Hampton Court Palace for reference, which is where I work as the kitchen garden keeper and vine keeper. I'll talk a little bit about the history of fruit growing here and then talk in a little bit more detail about the techniques that would have been used by the gardeners historically and the influence and importance of fruit growing at the palace. And I'll compare that to what we do today, what we grow and how we do it. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about the grapevine, which is the world's oldest and largest grapevine, which also lives at the palace. So this is Hampton Court Palace, which dates back to 1514. It's located in the furthest southwest part of London. It's got a rich history, including the Tudor, Georgian and Victorian periods. The palace is owned by the Crown, but it's run by the charity Historic Royal Palaces. And it's famous for its gardens, which attract many visitors each year. And the gardens are laid out around the outside of the palace, as this map shows, and this all sits within the wider area of Bushy Park and Home Park. Each of these different sections of the gardens have all got very different characters, as you can see from this slide here. Now, just to focus on the history of fruit cultivation at Hampton Court, um, one of my main sources for this was an article by Jan Woodstra, which is full of information about this subject, and I've included it in my list of references, which I think should be available at some point. So this guy on the left is Henry VIII, who was the English king between 1509 and 1547, and he famously liked his food, fruit included. Henry created what became known as the Great Orchard. He also employed a king's gardener who had the exciting sounding job of traveling to find new fruit varieties and then collect them and grow them. As well as this, he commissioned a large orchard to be planted in Kent, importing plants from the Netherlands, and this began the spread of orchards across the region. Now, although Henry became an infamous historical figure, he was a driving force between a lot of new innovations in industry. The painting on the right is from later on in the 1670s, which shows King Charles II being presented with a pineapple by the royal gardener. Now, this isn't a time period which is most associated with Hampton Court, but I do like this picture because it shows the prestige that was associated with being able to grow new and exotic things at the time and the importance of the gardener's role. However, a few years after this painting would have been made, the area which was Henry's Great Orchard at Hampton Court was turned into an area of trees and hedges with paths winding through them, which was known as the wilderness and was kind of more fashionable at the time. Then with the beginning of the reign of King William and Queen Mary in 1689, a new kitchen garden was developed. New walls were added between the existing ones for growing fruit and providing a sheltered microclimate. George London was in charge of the gardens at this time and together with Henry Wise, he wrote this book, The Retired Gardener, which is a translation of a French gardening manual adapted for an English climate. And this book tells us a lot about the horticultural practices of the time. And there's a great emphasis on planting fruit trees. And there's also an extensive list of the different fruit trees grown at Hampton Court, which is available. That's also from around then. Now, not many people's job description dates back 324 years, but this is a warrant to the superintendent of the gardens from 1698, which we can compare to maybe the head gardener's role today. And this quote shows the extent of the work that was done in the gardens at the time. I won't read all of this out, but it shows that there was a large workforce of different skill levels, that the procurement of dung, as they put it, was a priority for growing melons and making hotbeds. Looking through the list of tools, there's a lot of equipment that would have been used in fruit cultivation. Uh, they supplied fruit and herbs to the palace and they grew salads, which is much more than what we would think of as a salad nowadays and would have been a large variety of vegetables, herbs, flowers and fruit. Uh, I think this might even be uh, one of Susan Campbell's drawings in here, actually, and uh, another one that was used earlier in this, this webinar. Um, but we do know that between the early 18th and 19th centuries, there was a period of real innovation, as was mentioned before, with a lot of new varieties being bred and more fruit being grown in England. Um, we have some information about the techniques that they might have used and just the general growing practices of the time. And one of the sources that we can look at is a fascinating book from 1731, The Practical Fruit Gardener, written by Stephen Switzer. 
as with a lot of similar books, it's incredibly detailed. In the chapter recommending different fruit cultivars, eight pages are devoted to the ideal qualities of peaches, including exactly how hairy each fruit should be. Along with advice on grafting and root pruning, soil improvement and cultivation, there are interesting chapters talking about forcing plants to make them produce fruit out of season. And this is something which would certainly have taken place at Hampton Court and elsewhere to provide the luxury of fresh fruit to the royalty and to the very wealthy. Um, London and Wise in The Retired Gardener, they describe using pea homes as an umbrella attached to the wall to protect the fruit trees in the spring. And Switzer goes on to say that mats can also be used, which would have to be taken on and off to allow light and air to the tree. He describes how a wooden shelter would have been built around the tree with removable planks to protect them from fluctuations in temperature during flowering, or covering them with wooden hurdles with a thin layer of thatch to protect the trees on frosty nights. Uh, there's a great description of how they used to force cherries by stripping the leaves off a mature tree in August, then uh, dig it up and carefully replant it against a wall protected with a reed panel with hot manure piled against and underneath the wall and the manure was replaced every two weeks. And through this incredibly labour intensive method, they were able to make the tree produce fruit early in the spring. Um, the brick walls were specially constructed to radiate heat out, and this was further improved by adding stoves, which allowed the hot air to move through tunnels in the walls. And in this book, he hints that there might have been some trial and error involved in getting this to work and finding that it wasn't enough to only heat the upper parts of the plants, but that it was also necessary to introduce heat lower down, warming the soil and roots while keeping them well watered and adding fresh soil regularly. There would also have been other designs of heated glass houses with stoves and heating pipes. And all of this would have been an expensive process using a lot of foot fuel. So it was suggested that the heat could be used from laundry and kitchen buildings if they backed onto the fruit forcing houses. But this was all a delicate process and they didn't want to overheat or scold the trees. And having a barometer at the end of the forcing house meant that they could adjust the practices according to the weather. They would have had to open and close the glass lights in their greenhouses and frames regularly, depending on the weather and the daylight. They would have had to put trays of water in the glass house to increase the humidity when necessary and modify their watering and pruning for maximum fruit production. Um, some of his descriptions we might be a bit less keen to apply today, though, such as um, attempting to get rid of pests and diseases in an orchard by wheeling around a smouldering barrow full of burning straw and manure to fumigate, or as he puts it, refine the air. Um, it's interesting, though, that he's similarly dismissive of what to him were ancient gardening practices. And he mentions an old belief in warding off pests and diseases by using the skin of a crocodile. I think Switzer is justified in saying on the last page of his book here that the English gardeners arrived to the greatest perfection in their art. And reading it now as a professional gardener, it is astonishing the amount of work that it must have taken. Not only that, but the skill of the individuals doing it, which I don't think the majority of modern day gardeners would know how to do. Another book from later on in 1812 was George Brookshaw's Pomona Britannica. This collection of illustrations used a lot of fruit from Hampton Court as examples and is still widely regarded as one of the best works of its kind. Uh, we can compare the pictures in the book um, to the cultivars that we grow in the garden today, such as the pear, swan's egg, um, the Moor Park apricot, and also these black Hamburg grapes from the grapevine. And the gardens here continue to be used as an inspiration for artists, and the Hampton Court Palace Flora Legion Society continues the tradition of producing botanical art. Uh, looking at the history again, from about 1830, there was a sudden decline in fruit growing at the palace right up until 2014, when one section of the kitchen garden was reconstructed based on the original layout from the 1700s. And this is the kitchen garden today, or rather what it looks like in the summer. And here we grow a wide variety of fruits and vegetables, which are then sold to visitors on a market stall or supply the cafe on site. There are 254 no-dig beds, and around the perimeters, there's a band of soft fruit. Um, beyond the main path of the garden, there are flower borders, and then we have our trained fruit trees against the walls on the outside. And these trained fruit trees are an important part. They're an important feature of the kitchen garden. They've got a lot of history behind them, and they form an attractive background to the garden, and they demonstrate different growing techniques and make the best use of all the vertical space all of which could be applied to other gardens. I'll quickly run through now the fruit that we grow at Hampton Court. 
firstly, apples are probably one of the best examples of useful heritage cultivars. While the fruit might not have some of the characteristics that modern varieties are bred for, they often have a really good flavour. And you can't get a better apple than one of these freshly picked Worcester Permain on the bottom right picture here. Uh, most of the apples are grown as espaliers. They look great and are a classic formal kitchen garden feature. Most of the pruning for these is done in the summer using the modified Lorette system to shorten the laterals growing off each horizontal arm. And this allows a lot of fruit production in a very small space. Espaliers can also be grown as a fence, like here in the 20th century garden at Hampton Court. And uh, pears can also be espaliered or grown as a corton and are pruned in a very similar way to an apple. There's a central quince tree in the garden, and we also have a wool train specimen, which is a little bit unusual since they don't normally grow as neatly as an apple or a cherry does. However, it has been done successfully here, and it looks great when it flowers and bears fruit. And around the central tree, there are now some figs in pots here. Um, we're lucky enough to have an occasional volunteer who is also an artist who comes in uh, a few times a year and is very knowledgeable and does the pruning for us. We grow some fan and cordon plain trained plum trees against the east and west facing walls of the kitchen garden, which look really nice at this time of year, um, just to have that blossom covered fan when the garden is otherwise looking a little bit empty. And in the summer, this plum, a type called Hagnata, produces these large, huge, dark blue fruit. And we also grow old fashioned green, green gauges, which are delicious. The north facing wall of the dark garden doesn't get as much sunlight or warmth and is used for growing apple espaliers and morale cherry fans. Trellis wasn't generally used in the Georgian kitchen garden with the trees being directly tied to the pins, which were nailed into the wall, uh, some of which still remain in place today but we now use a trellis to protect the historic walls. On the warmer walls in the garden, there are peaches and nectarines and this moor park apricot, which is a historical cultivar, which was pictured in Pomona Britannica. There is a fan trained peach that makes a really great focal point at the end of the main pathway. I think it's only fair to mention that no garden's perfect and fruit grows on these trees each year. But if I'm perfectly honest, a lot of it does get eaten by birds or squirrels. Uh, we now have very few staff to run the garden. Um, myself and my colleague Itchaho and a team of volunteers are kept very busy weeding, harvesting, planting, pruning, looking after the vine, carrying out other maintenance and talking to visitors. So netting the wool fruit is unfortunately often a job that slips down to the bottom of the list of priorities. But uh, maybe this year we'll find the time. There's also a plat band of soft fruit bushes that surrounds the veg growing area of the garden, which contains 180 currant bushes and 70 heritage apples on very dwarfing rootstocks, surrounded by a short box hedge. This is an area that we do get more fruit from, since it's easier to put a net along the whole bed to protect it from birds. And last year, the bushes produced lots of red currants. Um, this is a before and after photo of what the winter pruning looks like. Um, we grow a lot of rhubarb, which isn't really a fruit, but it's eaten as a, dessert, as a dessert, so I'm going to quickly include it here. So nowadays we don't have the resources or the infrastructure to grow fruit out of season, the same as our predecessors did. There also isn't the same incentive to do so. Fresh fruit is imported and available in every supermarket and isn't the luxury that it once was. Rhubarb is an exception to this, which is still grown using a basic forcing technique. We cover the rhubarb crowns with a special terracotta pot in January, so they've got relative shelter from the elements, and then they start to grow when the light is excluded. And we get these long, pale coloured stems that grow very fast and taste really sweet and don't have the stringiness of older rhubarb. Along with asparagus, it's one of the first crops to be ready in the spring. And I think it's important as a vegetable grower to have something to look forward to in every season. And this is a real treat to enjoy at the end of winter. We have tried to replicate one of the old methods for growing melons though. Here's a hotbed being created using fresh manure, which gives off warmth as it ferments, which we've put a layer of compost on top of. However, we found that these particular beds didn't really get up to temperature, which I think might be because they just weren't quite high enough and didn't have enough mass to build up enough heat. We just use this area as raised beds for now, and they produce a nice salad and then a few melons in the summer. But our predecessors obviously had this down to a fine art and we're not quite there ourselves yet, but it would be great to experiment with this more in the future. 
Hampton Court is also home to a collection of citrus, which is kept in the nursery glass houses behind the scenes over the winter, and it's then moved outside to the orangery in the summer. And there's also a collection of fruits on the south front gardens, including this persimmon, um, some all trained fruits and an orchard of larger trees. And these techniques that we use today have been developed over years by the application of gardeners' knowledge and skill and creativity. While they might not have had the same understanding of subjects like chemistry and biology, the horticultural practices of the 1700s appear just as advanced as what we do today, and perhaps more so given the intensity with which it was carried out, and all the more remarkable for not having access to chemical fertilizers or pesticides or electrical heating or lighting. Instead, they had to rely on their ingenuity and what was available to them at the time. And this is a quote that appeared on the website of the Wall Kitchen Garden Network just last week um, from the conductor, William Christie. And he says that you can put a tree like that in the same category as a beautiful painting or a beautiful sculpture or a beautiful piece of music. And he's absolutely right. A gardener creates something just like an artist does. Planting a border, they'll consider the colours, composition, shapes and textures, just like an artist uses layers of paint to form a picture. When a gardener is pruning a fruit tree, it's just like a sculpture. They'll be thinking also in four dimensions, considering what will grow years later. They can prune to encourage or restrict growth and achieve the desired shape. They'll have to use their understanding of how the different trees growth habits to decide how to do this and when's the best time to prune. Art is often a slow process and the best results in growing a fruit tree are often from resisting the temptation to prune too drastically when you've got the pruning saw in your hand and have the patience to shape a tree over a number of years, not removing too much growth all at once. A good example of fruit growing as an art form is in viticulture. Grapevine pruning, especially the concept of gentle pruning, considers the flow of sap through the vine to create an open shape without any blockages in it. By shaping each individual vine, you form an entire unique landscape in a vineyard. Uh, this photo, by the way, isn't at Hampton Court, it's at Skeynes Hill. And growing fruit and vegetables competitively is another whole world of horticulture in itself, and this is most definitely an art form. Here we see an exceptional level of care and attention to detail, as well as commitment and creativity to create something amazing. A prized vegetable or a collection of fruit right, might represent months of work and years of experience, just like a great piece of art. And I hasten to add these grapes at a competition last year were grown by other people and they're, they're not from the gardens here. And just to finish, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the grapevine, which is the world's oldest and biggest grapevine. It's a black Hamburg planted when Lancelot Capability Brown was head gardener in 1768. And there's been a long tradition of having a vine keeper and now that responsibility has fallen to me. So no pressure. So this last part of the talk is just a little bit about the maintenance of this amazing plant. The vine's over 250 years old. It's four meters around the base of the trunk and these rods or arms extend along the length of the greenhouse, the longest of which reaches 36.5 meters. It occupies its own glass house. This one is the fifth or sixth on the site and was built in 1969. It has this viewing area within the glass house so visitors can walk through and see the vine. At the moment in the winter, the vine is in its dormant phase. This is the time for pruning, bark scraping, and then applying a winter wash. It's also important to keep the vine house generally tidy and get rid of any debris that might harbour pests and diseases from year to year. In the spring, as the temperature increases, the first shoots start to appear. Um, the greenhouse has heating, so we don't have the same worries about frost as anybody trying to grow vines outside. There's rapid growth in the spring and early summer. Vines in general are really vigorous plants, and although the trunk is indoors, the roots are spread over a large area outside, and this is regularly fed with a thick layer of manure. This means lots of pruning, cutting back those new shoots. This photo was taken after it was all done, working from one end to the other using scaffolding and this walkway above the viewing area. So it's one of those jobs where by the time you reach one end, you have to go back to the other and start it all over again. The next job will be thinning the bunches of fruit. This is important to prevent overcropping. And then over a few years in, oh, sorry, over a few weeks in September, I'll harvest the grapes. On average, it produces 270 kilos of grapes a year or about a thousand bunches. 
I'm not sure when this photo on the left was taken, but sometime in the 20th century. But the process of packing the grapes is exactly the same as it was then. Although I don't wear a suit and tie to work, which would be a great look, but maybe not the most practical as it gets incredibly hot in the vine house in the summer. I weigh the bunches, um, inspect them and remove any damaged grapes and then box them up and take them to the palace shop where they're sold to the public. The grapes used to only be, be consumed by the royal family and the, the bunches of grapes were even numbered to make sure that nobody else took any, but now they can be enjoyed by anybody who visits the palace. They're a nice fruit um, for eating as a dessert grape, although they do have seeds in, so they wouldn't be suitable for making wine from. And shortly after the harvest, it's autumn, so the leaves start to change colour and fall off. The main job at this time of year is raking the leaves up and collecting them. And then it's time to start the process again. So pruning out all of last year's growth, forming the structure on which the vine will grow, and then fruit on again next year. Then finally, I like this photo with the two people at the end of it, just because I think, because I think it shows the scale of the vine. And having such a striking plant as this, I think represents what's important about conserving heritage fruits and growing techniques. The grapevine has taken over 250 years and generations of expertise to create what we see today. While a lot of these skills are no longer needed for commercial fruit production, they're a part of our heritage and they are an art form. And hopefully we can continue to take inspiration from the past, uh, continue to learn and then preserve these skills into the future.